So good afternoon, uh, Eva, and uh, thank you to both of you, Eva and Bertrand, for having inviting me again to, to this meeting. Um, I did once for, once against, and now I'm back against. <laughs> um, to treat or not to treat, and if so, when? Um, I think my colleague um, had presented a quite biased point of view. <laughs> and um, I am also biased because, as you see, I'm supported by all these companies that uh, sell drugs to treat patients, but I will tell you that we don't have to treat patients. So let's go back to this randomized trial and just consider one thing, which is one word which is not highlighted in this presentation, but is selected patients. So if you select patients that are asymptomatic or that have a low tumor burden, and I will come to that later on, there are several trials which are old, but that clearly shows that there is no difference in overall survival between watch and wait and intervention. Michele Gelmini said that these are old treatment regimens uh, with old drugs, but the prom one of the first trials, the PROMACE-MOP, is quite uh, very harsh chemotherapy including a uh, regimen. And I'm not aware of any trials that have demonstrated that in this kind of patient, early intervention changed the natural history of the disease. If we move further, and maybe I have uh, 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 missed it one, uh, clearly we were there 15 years ago when clearly watchful waiting was validated and was the best option available for patients. But suddenly rituximab came and single agent rituximab appeared to be one promising agent to be used in this context. Good efficacy, about 75% of response, some long-term molecular response, although we don't know exactly what it means, and minimal toxicity. However, if we look at all these series, and there are at least uh, four series of patients, including one led by my opponent, have shown that the median PFS after four infusion of rituximab is very short usually less than three years, and usually two years to two years and a half, and this has also some cost. Does it delay the time to the next treatment? Well, let's go back to uh, some older study, and this is the Curieta Deshna study that was mentioned by uh, uh, um, Dr. Gelmini, showing clearly that uh, the median time to the first systemic treatment for those patients that were on observation was in the range of 2.6 years. If we go back to the update of one of these trials, which is the one we conducted uh, uh, in France, uh, you can see that the median time to uh, 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 progression and start a new treatment is about 23.5 months. So it's not even better. There have been some uh, observation of patients uh, that were under watch and wait in the rituximab era, and uh, this work comes from the uh, F2 study, which was conducted by one of the other speakers uh, here, which actually uh, collected prospectively uh, data among uh, uh, patients with newly diagnosed follicular lymphoma. And Philippe solal Cellini, which was one of the investigators, actually analyzed the cohort of patients that uh, uh, were treated with observation, or basically were observed on watchful waiting. And I think these curves are quite interesting because these are not randomized trials, but that's just real life patients. And as you can see, the survival is excellent as usually those patients do. But also the time to start lymphoma therapy, as you can see, about half of the patient had to start between two and three years, but there is a substantial proportion uh, that continue to be without treatment for very prolonged period of life, clearly meaning that these patients are symptomatic because in real life, since they will have presented any symptoms, I'm sure that physician will have uh, treated them. Does it even hamper the ability to treat this patient later? And I think that's quite an interesting curve which comes also from this paper. This is a freedom from treatment failure after initiation of a treatment according to initial management. So what the blue curve shows you is that patients that were treated with watch and wait when you initiate a new treatment, you have this curve with uh, uh, about a duration of uh, 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 treatment that lasts for almost five years. And if you take those patients that had rituximab as single agent and look at the next therapy, you can see that it's not better. So 
you cannot really harm this patient in terms of the efficacy of the next treatment if you watch and wait, and maybe it's not that good to treat them with single agent. So you may say, well, for infusion of rituximab, that's not enough, and my opponent has developed several approach to uh, prolong this kind of rituximab intervention in, in uh, patients. So um, he already mentioned this trial uh, led by our colleagues from United Kingdom. I just would like to point that uh, this trial had a lower accrual, uh, despite actually some uh, nice collaboration around the world between those patients that were on watchful waiting, those patients that were randomized to four infusion only, or those that had four infusion and then two years of maintenance. So low accrual that they had to discontinue one arm, which was the one with four infusion only. Well, we have seen this uh, curve already, which is a time to initiation of new therapy, which obviously was lower in those patients that had no treatment. However, as said by my colleague, most of these patients actually started with chemotherapy, not because they needed that, but because in the United Kingdom at that time, rituximab was not available for this patient and not commercialized for those patients, United Kingdom being uh, the, most, uh, the, pa the country that accrues the most patient. There is also a detail that was on the slide of my uh, colleague who said there is less anxiety in these patients that started treatment. Well, they are less anxiety because they had to sign an informed consent saying, well, either you are treated or you are not treated. But in real life, I think we all face patients that we don't treat and that do very well over many years. Overall survival, I think this is clearly shown. Yes, there may be some patients that transform, but they have not been treated, and you can usually treat them well. And it has been shown by several groups, including the Vancouver group, that using RCHOP in patients that are not uh, previously treated with transformation of follicular lymphoma can lead to substantially good results in these years. But our colleagues uh, from the United States actually further investigated the use of rituximab prolonged administration. Um, they did this very particular trial where all patients received for infusion and rituximab and then were randomized to either maintenance, one infusion every three months, or treatment at progression. And they define a primary endpoint, which is a little bit complex, which is no response to retreatment, progressive disease within six months of the last administration of rituximab, initiation of cytotoxic therapy, or inability to stay on the trial. So if you look at the secondary endpoints, which is a little bit unusual to start with those, uh, you may say, well, it's fantastic. The PFS is better if you use a prolonged treatment with rituximab and the time to start chemo also. But if you look really at this primary endpoint, which defines the time you fail to, to, to continue to pay, put your patients uh, 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 with uh, an efficiency of rituximab treatment, you clearly show that there is no difference. And I think the editorials that accompany this paper really state that there is no role of any prolonged administration of rituximab for this patient. So I think that despite the data that we have seen from the SAC, which are still, uh, uh, I guess, not published, the clinical benefit of prolonged rituximab treatment in follicular lymphoma patients is not established. Well, if treatment is we needed, when do we need treatment? Well, one first word. There was a very interesting paper published this year showing that uh, if you screen all of you, half of you will have T14, 18 positive cells in per the peripheral blood. And a few of us, or a few, uh, may have substantial level of these cells, which may eventually predispose and increase the risk to truly develop follicular lymphoma, just to show that this is a very indolent disease that develops over years before it becomes clinically obvious. And this is a time to develop follicular lymphoma according to the presence of these cells in the peripheral blood. Well, should you treat these patients early while they don't have disease? I don't think so. Furthermore, I think there was a very in interesting publication presented at ASH, which is now submitted, which is a collaboration between the Mayo Clinic and our centers uh, in Lyon. Um, we looked at the patients that had an event after being diagnosed with follicular lymphoma, whatever the way they were managed, either with watch and wait, with rituximab single agent, or with immunochemotherapy. The curve on the top describes you the outcome of all patients. If you see, first of all, that the, uh, uh, all patients that achieve this uh, lack of event during the first year of the diagnosis have clearly a survival 
that is identical to the U.S. mage population or for those that were in France to the French-based population. If they fail to do so, well, then they are, you are in danger and these patients don't do that well. And on the bottom curve, these are clearly the patients that were managed with observation. And as you can see, this is strictly similar. If they didn't have any event during the first year, they do very well. Only if they fail to achieve this one year without event, they start to, to be sl slightly uh, 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 not the same survival. But as you can see, this is not significantly different. So it clearly shows that you don't uh, uh, decrease the probability of survival of this patient. And if nothing happens within one year, uh, those patients do well. So we have criteria to define what are these patients that can be managed. I will not argue that all patients should not be treated, but they have very simple criteria to define a group of patients that do not have any symptoms related to this disease. And in those patients, I will clearly argue that we don't need to treat them. For the other ones, I think uh, there is a, a, a way to treat them, and I think one of the best ways still remains our chemo followed by our maintenance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill.